Livy is our next speaker tonight. She is not only the, uh, she was the host or one of the superstars on The Biggest Loser, Transformation. Uh, she is the women's fitness, the fitness uh, writer for Women's Health Magazine, something like that. She's on a bunch of different TV and media stuff. She has this thing called Buff Girls and um, a whole bunch of uh, things going on. She has her own gym. She's about to be on Channel 10, all this kind of stuff. Would you like to come and share your story, my dear? Thank you. Oh, yeah, I've got a mic. I've got a mic. Hi, guys. Oh, I can see some of you. Oh, I'm getting music. Okay, we better get up and have a dance then. Come on, guys. Why don't you be sitting down? Come on, pop the tune. I wasn't going to do this. Let's just do it. Let's be fearless. Okay, should I give you some moves? Everyone take this hand. Ready? Here we go. You got to copy me. Very good. Other hand. to living next time but uh, do you feel like you moved a little bit at least? <laughs> Hi guys, uh, I must admit I came from another speaking event tonight and I currently feel far too grey and blue for the circus of ideas so I'm really pleased I've got pink shoes because I didn't get the memo for Mexican hats and cool circus ring hats but it's okay, I love a story. I'm an ex-journalist so I wasn't really cool with this whole I'm not in on the costuming tonight. So I went outside and I thought, what can I do, what can I do? Went to Woolies, crossed the way. Couldn't find any costumes there. I actually did. <laughs> I found chocolate though, so that was good. Um, and then I thought, don't worry, I've got it. Took the ponytail out, shook out the hair, and I am the lion for the night, everyone. So thank you. <laughs> so I've got the mane. Now, uh, part of this story, I sat outside the bench outside Woolies just now, and I thought, okay, if I'm going to be the lion for the night, I've got the mane now. Um, what are some facts about lions? So I googled it, and I had a little look, and I found out some really cool stuff I didn't actually know. Now, don't worry, this is going somewhere. But I find out, found out something that I did not know tonight, which is that if a lion mates with a leopard, that's actually got a name, it's called a lepon. And if a lion mates with a jaguar, it's called a jag lion. And if it mates with a tiger, it's called a guess. A liger. Very good, very good. So there were my three random facts. I didn't know that and I'm pretty excited that I now do. Um, but I did find out something else about the lion that was actually useful, aside from the fact that it mates with numerous things. And actually when it does mate with those things, it comes out with the head of a lion and the body of the other thing. Weird. Um, but I did also find out that lions, and this is cool, right? Lions actually do feel fear. Now, this is awesome because lions are king of the jungle, master and prince of the plains. But it turns out they actually do feel fear. It's really similar to the human response when we feel fear. And they fear it, or they feel it, they feel it and they fear it, just before they go on a big hunt. Now, lions are hunters, right? That's who we know them as. They are the king of hunting. But they're only successful in their hunt 50% of the time. And they fear every hunt they go on. Now that's pretty cool. And I asked myself, what would happen if a lion didn't actually succeed in its hunt? So it doesn't succeed. Fun fact, number four, lions actually sleep for 22 hours a day and they hunt for two, so that's cool. I uh, don't know where they find the time for other things. But if they are unsuccessful in their hunt, do you think that lion goes, you know what, that was scary, and it also sucked. So now I'm gonna sleep for 24 hours a day from now on, because this hunting business, it's over, I'm not doing that again, <laughs> right? I don't think so. That lion gets back up and goes out and hunts again the next day. Now, the question I ask is why? I mean, maybe because it's hungry, but why else? Because, as we talked about before, the lion has a culture of being the hunter. 
Its whole life culture is, I am king of the jungle, I'm going to get out there, I'm going to hunt some shit down. And that's what it does every single day and protects its pride. Now, this is a topic that's really close to my own heart, not lions, but creating epic life cultures for yourself. The people that I see that make the biggest impact in the world have a really awesome life culture, a life that's aligned to their values. Is there anyone in this audience who is a business person, who owns a business? That's pretty good. Bondi, entrepreneurs. Who has worked for a business before? Okay, that's good, because otherwise, uh, I don't know how you afforded this ticket. But basically, any of you who have owned a business or worked in a business before know the importance of culture, right? Culture eats strategy for breakfast. I mean, I've got five different businesses, and I know that I can write a great strategy for any one of them. But if I don't actually have an epic culture in place for my team, then I may as well just throw that strategy out the window. Culture is built on the values that you create together as a team, the vision that you decide on, the behaviours that you all show when you go out there in the market and the point of difference that you have. And all of those things give you a purpose and create a, a business culture. And the top businesses out there, they have epic cultures. You look at the Googles and the Twitters and the Facebooks and all that jazz. So... I really like to talk to people about changing or creating their own epic life culture. Now, I do that a lot in the health and fitness space because I think people have a lot of fear around getting fit and getting healthy. You know, they don't know what to do or it's too hard or they self-judge, whatever it might be. So I like to teach people that it's actually about aligning what you do with your health and fitness with the values that you have and create a culture for yourself that's super strong and it makes you get up every morning without needing motivation. So I'll give you a couple of really cool examples of this just to, to tell you what I mean. So some people that have some epic life cultures. We just talked about waves. We talked about riding waves. So let's talk about Sally Fitzgibbons. She's my ultimate girl crush, right? Super hot, you know, younger than me, but with the same kind of hair, so it's all good. Um, but the Sally Fitzgibbons has this culture of being the sporty kid. Yeah, so she basically uh, could have been successful at any sport she tried. She was a runner before she played team sports, before she turn turned to surfing, and in each of those sports, she was hugely successful and competed at a really high level. So Sally Fitzgibbons, her culture, I'm the sporty kid, I love it, I'm competitive, I live to get out there and run. She talks all the time about how her mindset is driven by the time she spends on the road just running and pounding the pavement. She's able to manage her own mindset that way and her, her state. Let's look at someone else. Taria Pitt. Do you guys know who she is? She, yeah, she's the, the amazing woman who got burnt going on an ultra marathon. 65% of her body ended up in burns. Now, she's got more excuses than any of us never to be fit, never to be healthy. But as soon as she was able to, she was up and walking, and then she was running, and then she was swimming, and then she was cycling, and now she's back competing in ultra marathons. Now, her life culture is one of adventure. She's always been the adventurous person, traveling, hiking, running, exploring, climbing mountains. And when she came out of that Burns, Burns unit, she talked a lot about how her life culture was, of adventure was so strong and was running through absolutely every part of her, so strong that the calling of it was in her mind every day. And all she wanted to do was get back up there and climb another mountain. And that's what got her through. Because of that, she went back to what she'd always done, and those excuses didn't come up. You know, another person might be Richard Branson. He's a business person, but he's, his life culture, I'd say, is fun. He values fun over everything, fun and experimentation and, and, you know, inventing. And so his life culture is one of fun, and he needs to be healthy in order to enjoy that. When I Googled Richard Branson the other, way, uh, other day, trying to come up with a, a visual for some people on this, I saw this, uh, this photo of him water skiing with like a naked model on his back. And uh, I thought, oh my God, his poor wife. But aside from that, this guy is just having a ball and he couldn't do that. There's no way he can, you know, go heli skiing with a naked model if he's not fit and healthy. And that's not a good example. But you know what I mean, guys, right? It's all about being fit and healthy. Now, for me... 
I had a really clear, um, similar to what Grant had, I had a moment in my life where this all came to front of mind for me. In my early 20s, I was, you know, I thought I was fit and I was thought I was healthy, but I kind of had that that healthy that was like, you know, toast and peanut butter and coffee in the morning and then coffee and a muffin at morning tea and then pasta salad, pasta salad for lunch and then, you know, some kind of snack with some more coffee in the afternoon and then wine and takeaway tie for dinner, but it had veggies in it, so that's good. That's very good. Uh, but yeah, that was, that was kind of my life, right? And I thought I was doing okay. I was pretty healthy. I was young. I was indestructible. And then one day, I turned up at work and I got this massive migraine, like a migraine to beat all migraines, so big, so pounding that I thought my brain was going to explode. And it didn't stop there. All of a sudden, I had these poundings in my chest. I had shaking. I was sweating. I felt like I was going to be sick. And I thought I was actually having an anxiety attack. You know, I thought, okay, I'm having an anxiety attack. You know, very logical. I'm a journalist. I've written about this before. It's okay. But that came back for me every day for the next six months, so badly that I couldn't speak in front of a crowd anymore. I was barely barely progressing at work anymore, and I used to be a little gung-ho, you know, chasing every opportunity I could. But all of that kind of went away, and, and not only that, I, I couldn't go in an aeroplane or I literally would end up vomiting in the toilets. I couldn't do the things I used to do, like go surfing or go diving because I'd just end up a mess. And this is really strange. I couldn't figure out what it was, and of course I didn't go to the doctor because I was in my early 20s. So I thought, I'm indestructible. This can't be anything. Um, but it did turn out to be something. I went to donate blood. Um, o negative here, have to donate blood every three months, otherwise the blood people come chasing you like a mofo. And so I went to donate blood one day, I hadn't done it in about six months, went in there and the nurses freaked out. And I mean freaked out, sit still, don't move, we're getting an ambulance. Now it turns out I had basically blood pressure that was almost three times what it should have been. You know, blood pressure is usually 120, 120 over 70. Mine was up at 300 over about 160, 170. Uh, so they didn't really think I should be alive, but I am and I was and that's good. Um, it turns out that I'd had this for the whole six months. They thought that I was going to have this for the rest of my life and I was put on extreme amounts of medication in order to combat that. So about three times the amount of medication that was the max, uh, and that was the only thing that would bring it down. Now, that medication, as it turns out, would allow me to surf and fly again, would allow me to dive again, but it wouldn't allow me to ever have kids. And that's pretty confronting as a young woman. That wasn't good enough for me, and, and suddenly um, I felt a lot of fear. You know, I felt a, a lot of fear, and um, at first it, it put me into a bit of a panic. And then someone said to me, a passing comment one of the doctors made actually, just walked past me and said, you know what, honey, sometimes fear just really shows up what it is that we value most. And I thought, aha, uh -huh, that's really cool. So fear shows what we value most in life. At this point in time, what, I, what was becoming really clear was that I was fearing this lack of freedom of choice this having to be on medication my whole life, this having to ne never been able to have kids, all, all the choice taken away. So, so something that I really valued at that point was freedom. I valued freedom, I valued health, I valued love because I didn't want to leave the people I loved behind and I, I really valued creativity and, and I wanted to be able to express myself in whatever way I wanted without being bound by a medication that kind of dulled everything I was feeling. And so... That was a real gift in my life because I suddenly realized that, you know what? Fear is kind of like a friend. It actually helps you to realize what you value most in life. What I realized at that time is that I, I valued all those things and I wanted them back. And so I went on this big mission to hunt down how the heck am I supposed to eat good, like what am I eating that's not helping? What, how am I moving my body that's not helping? Are there stress reduction things that I could be doing? I, I just became the biggest student. You know, I went and assisted naturopaths, nutritionists, trainers for free every single weekend just to learn what they knew. And it was the first time that I really in my life was able to take back the power because about a year, no, well, about a year later, I was able to kind of reduce the medication a little bit. And then another year later, I reduced it a little bit more and a little bit more. And I now haven't been on that medication for many, many years. And I don't need it. And that's not to say that that's going to be the same for everyone. 
But for me, it turned out that my body was having a massive stress response just to a lot of little things that it was sensitive to. And that was affecting my entire life. So turn that around, and that's pretty cool. But the, the thing is, and, and I guess the, the message that I want to get across to you now is that that experience shifted my entire life culture because suddenly I realized what I valued in life. I realized what was important to me. And I linked that to the rest of my life and my health and my fitness. I will never eat really shitty food again. I don't even look at fries sideways. I'll never look at a, a processed packaged chocolate that has, you know, 70% sugar in it, which is most Cadbury, unfortunately. But, you know, I won't even look at it. And it's not because I'm going, oh, Libby, I really shouldn't have that. It's because that doesn't make me, that's not in li aligned with what I want for my life. So my life culture shifted and then everything to do with health and fitness became easier. Next step on the, on the path was, was business. You know, looking at what I really valued in life. Like, was I, what, did I really love being part of this big corporate? Well, no, every day I went in fearing that I would not make deadline, that I would not make sales targets. All this stuff, um, fearing that as a journalist, I'd walk in and they'd make me do a, a death knock, which is where if a kid dies overnight, I have to turn up the next morning and knock on their door of the parents and say, how do you feel? You know, that's an awesome job. Um, but so, so that, that, those things I kind of feared too, and that made me think, well, what do I value? And what I actually value in, in, I guess, in work is making people feel better. What I valued is showing people that health and fitness could be simple, that there are little things you can do that can actually change your life. Now, you don't need to be born with an epic life culture, how I believe Sally Fitz and, and Turia Pitt probably were, and you don't need a life-changing event in order to shift your own life culture. I had a life-changing event, but you don't need that. What I teach people now every single day is how they can change their own life cultures and set it up so that anything they want to be motivated for, they are. Because I honestly have found out now that motivation is not something that arrives, it's something that you create through taking action and, and creating momentum. And then the motivation arrives because you're doing cool shit. So for me, changing your life culture comes down to three things. It comes down to the clear intentions you set, it comes down to the powerful states you choose and the little actions that you consistently take. Now, all of those things have to be driven by your values because setting goals or intentions without linking them to your values, they're kind of meaningless. You know, it's like, why are you doing it? And that's when goals become stressful, I think. When you've set this goal because you think you should have a goal, but you're not sure that it actually means something to you, and therefore it becomes a little bit meaningless. So for me, I like to just switch out the word goals and use the word intentions and set clear intentions. Now that word intentions is basically the same as goals, but it reminds me not to be too attached to the outcome because it's aligned with my greater vision. Now my mission, my vision in life has become to change the life cultures of as many Australians as possible, to help them create a movement culture, a healthy eating culture, um, you know, a, a passionate business culture. That's my mission. And therefore all the intentions I set, whether it's opening a gym, jumping on The Biggest Loser Transformed, whatever it might be, coming to speak to you guys tonight, if I do a terrible job of those things, one of those things, even though I've given them my all, because it's not an end point, because there's a greater vision, like a north star or a beacon that guides me home, I, instead of going, that goal didn't work out, I suck, I go, okay, cool, what's next? I'm not too, detached to, too attached to that outcome. And so it just allows you to do that. That's a clear intention that you set. The next thing is the powerful states that you choose to show up in. And this is something that I think is really interesting. And whenever you see someone do this, Set a clear intention that's aligned to a clear vision and then choose a powerful state to show up in for themselves or for others, you get what Grant has achieved. You get someone with an absolute clear mission that affects all the people around them and that will also create a life culture change for them. You know, Grant, sorry to use you as an ex as a example, but it's just perfect, the story that you just gave, and I love stories. You know, he didn't feel particularly in power over his own emotions. He didn't feel like he was any good, that he could survive. And now he has this epic business whose whole mission is to make other people feel worthy, feel happy, feel connected, feel like there is hope, there is next, 
there is something greater in a community that loves them and will look after them no matter what, and that if you just catch one wave, hey, that might be all it takes. And because of that, I bet he doesn't get up in the morning anymore and have to think, how will I get out of bed? He's getting out of bed because he's got a damn good reason to do so. So it's worth looking at your own life and your own health and your own vision and thinking, have I created a life culture? Have I created a vision that's linked to intrinsically to my values that's going to drive me and motivate me in everything that I do? And if you're not sure where to start with that, how to set those clear intentions, set that vision, and then choose to show up in a powerful state for others or for yourself, and you do choose your state. You choose your energy every day. You choose not to say, I should do this, but to say, I want to do this. And by the way, switching those little words can make all the difference. I should go to the gym, but, uh -uh, change it, I want to go to the gym because I should do X, Y, and Z today, but I want to because it can be a little change that makes all the difference. But if you are struggling to find out what it is for you that gets you out of bed, I just like to think of it in terms of a why. Now, lots of people say that, but here's the point of difference that I'm going to give you today, and it's a really simple one. I like to think of the word why, W-H-Y, as standing for how is the world helped by you. And isn't that a simple little tweak that changes the whole way you think about it? Suddenly you're not thinking, oh, what's my values? Now I've got to go and do a big values chat and think about it, and I don't even know where to start. Oh, all you have to do is go, why? Why is the, how is the world helped by me? And that world could be your family, it could be your friendship world, it could be the world of your greater community, it could be the entire world, because that's what I'm going for. But I'll start with Australia. Just joking, starting Bondi. Um, but really, how is the world helped by you? And that just changes the way you do things. Like, what, what are you doing at work and how can, how can the world be helped by you? One of the coolest local businesses here, Trio Cafe over in the, on the Campbell Parade in Bondi, um, the owner, Ronan, I don't know if you notice when you go in there, everyone, all the wait staff are incredibly lovely. They do this thing at the start of their shift where they go, we've got an opportunity today to not just serve people food, but to change their entire day, to make them feel so much better about life. So how are we going to do that today? And they choose a word, whether they want to make people feel happier or they want to make people feel, I don't know, feel like they've, they've turned a corner or they pick out the sad ones and try and give them a smile or, or ask them about themselves. And they go on this mission, not just to serve people food, but to actually change their day, and how cool is that? That's how their world is helped by them. So look, I won't go into big detail about the little actions you take. There are so many little actions you can take every day to improve, improve your health, whether it's going for a walk. One thing we did is chuck out our TV and go for a night walk after dinner every night, and that's made all the difference in our family. It just connects you to everyone that, that's around you, and it's such a simple thing you can do for your health. But whatever it is, whether it's health, whether it's business, whether it's friendship groups, I would encourage you guys to think, what is my life culture? Do I have a healthy life culture, a passionate life culture? Have I built my life on the values that mean the most to me? Have I created a vision from those values? Have I set clear intentions that feed that vision? Am I choosing a powerful state to show up in? And am I taking little actions every day that help me move towards a bigger why for myself? How is the world helped by me? but the world helped by you guys. And remember that fear is just the friend that encourages you, or I guess points out to you, what you really value most. So I would encourage you guys to not fear less, but fear more. Fear more in order to help others feel less. Fear less, not feel less. Fear more in order to help others feel less. And really Get in touch with what that fear is telling you to find out how the world can become a better place because of you guys. I hope that gives you a little bit of food for thought, guys. But thank you so much for having me tonight and my lion's mane. <laughs> I appreciate it.